Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Two months into the Gaza war launched by the savage Hamas attack on thousands of Israeli civilians, the Middle East is still absorbing all of the related geostrategic implications, both those shaped by the war and those impacting on it. The very definition of the region's boundaries and focal points requires an update. As per usual, the main players are the Levant, northeastern Africa, the Persian Gulf and Turkey. However, the war has now ushered Yemen and the Bab el-Mandab choke point onto center stage. So in the short term, what are those geostrategic implications and is there a possible change in their direction or intensity if the fortunes of war take a different turn? Joining us for the discussion from southern Israel is retired Colonel Dr. Ran Lerman, who is a co-host of TV7's Middle East Review, who formerly served as Israel's Deputy Director of its National Security Council. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Also joining us from an undisclosed location is Dr. Nir Bohms, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. And uh, also uh, from uh, elsewhere is joining us uh, TV7's editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. It's good to have you, uh, Mr. Oren. Uh, and let's immediately also dive into to, uh, today's topic. Uh, how do you see the current geostrategic uh, implications emanating from the war in Gaza? So the war in Gaza, uh, right uh, at the start, uh, was influenced by uh, President Biden's decision to intervene by sending uh, two uh, aircraft carrier task forces, one to the Eastern Mediterranean, the Ford, and one to the Persian Gulf, the Ike, uh, along with a nuclear submarine and uh, fighter planes. And uh, by that uh, uh, step, uh, he actually announced that the United States is back and because there was no um, any other uh, world power or even uh, regional power stepping in to uh, uh, copy what uh, the United States uh, did, if it could, the United States is now uh, the overwhelming uh, regional power. Uh, of course, this has to wait until the war ends because uh, uh, Biden has already absorbed several blows by the fact that he sided with uh, Israel um, to such an extent that uh, his uh, uh, electoral base uh, probably suffered uh, from, uh, from this. China and Russia are yet uh, to be seen in the area uh, more than two months after the war started, but the fact that they have a veto power in the uh, UN Security Council gives them a lot of leverage if diplomacy, either in Lebanon, where Israel, of course, would not tolerate a return to the status quo uh, before uh, the 7th of October, uh, Israel would obviously demand strengthening Resolution uh, 1701 from 17 uh, years ago, or in Gaza, where some new order uh, would have to be established. Uh, this will test the uh, uh, relationship between the United States, China, and Russia. As for the uh, uh, regional powers, as you mentioned, Turkey and Iran are, of course, involved. Egypt is a very important uh, regional power, and uh, Israel had to tailor its uh, military operations in Gaza especially in the south, in the Khan Yunus and Rafah areas, so that Egypt uh, will not be concerned with uh, an influx of uh, refugees from Gaza. And uh, the new regional uh, actor, Yemen. So um, earlier this week, uh, we heard that uh, in Washington, they had the bright idea that in order to stop uh, the Houthis, in uh, Yemen from uh, uh, hitting uh, innocent passage of uh, maritime uh, movements of shipping. They will send uh, their emissary, Lender King, to Sana in order to try and solve the internal problems there. If there is uh, domestic peace, 
in uh, Yemen. Uh, that's how the thinking goes. Then the Houthis will be satisfied and will no longer act as Iran's proxies. Doesn't sound very realistic, but there you have it. Well, a disconnect indeed. <laughs> Nevertheless, it seems like uh, there is a lot of appearances of activities. And on the other hand, there are concrete actions. And therefore, one needs to clearly identify what is just for appearance and what is uh, uh, not so, just uh, a note that uh, may not uh, seem relevant, but um, all American submarines are nuclear. They're nuclear fueled. Some are nuclear also armed, but specifically the uh, submarine that was sent to the Middle East was nuclear fueled with uh, non-nuclear weaponry, uh, even though quite lethal, uh, nonetheless, not nuclear, and, and this may have been misinterpreted over the period of time. Uh, a second point that uh, was just announced today, and, and for this I would like actually to ask Dr. Bums uh, to remark on this. Uh, the Emiratis have struck a deal, or an Emirati company uh, has struck a deal with an Israeli company in order to transit goods from the United Arab Emirates through Saudi Arabia going all the way into the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and entering into Israel, effectively circumventing the Bab el-Mandab. Of course, this has far-reaching implications to uh, the Egyptians who uh, suffer economically from any shipping that does not transit through uh, the, the Strait of Hormuz. Nonetheless, it does seem like a good uh, circumvent uh, from the threats emanating from there, from the Suez Canal, excuse me, indeed. Uh, and therefore, how do you see this and what does this send uh, in context of a signal to all the adversaries and those malign actors see t seeking to disrupt maritime shipping? Namely, the main culprit is not other than the Islamic Republic of Iran. Well, if you're looking at uh, the, uh, the UAE's policy objectives, uh, when you're looking at the, the 2030 plan and if you're looking at the... Uh, the, the recent uh, 10 important uh, policy objectives, you'll see that uh, prosperity and repromotion of business is very much at the core. A and uh, focusing for a moment in the midst of this particular conflict, uh, the thinking of uh, a potential route uh, that uh, is good for prosperity, that involves a number of other countries in the region, and showing that some of that can continue to work uh, even in the middle of uh, conflagration which influences the entire region is a very important statement on two levels one it uh, shows uh, that uh, despite uh, of uh, this uh, gaza war and of course the iranian and the hamas related attempts to uh, revolve move back all the progress related to the abraham accords normalization integration in the region uh, they're not going to be able to succeed and second, this particular route can also even be positive in terms of bringing even humanitarian aid uh, uh, and create a, another type of uh, a, a positive influence and an alternative uh, uh, route um, that can potentially show a win-win even for the Palestinian side. This is and also it should be seen as an indication that the Iran-related, Hamas-related agenda cannot occupy the entire Middle East, and that the routes, literally the routes of uh, progress, uh, now uh, looking at roads and, and trains, uh, need to be continued. Uh, and having seen this at this time uh, is important, and I hope that we'll see more of this, because this is a part uh, of the ongoing tension, uh, and we need to remember uh, that uh, a part of what uh, Hamas and Iran attempted to uh, destroy here is exactly this type of progress. Thank you, Dr. Bombs. Uh, Dr. Leoman, this also sends a clear signal uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that rapprochement does not seem to be off the table. And uh, just going back memory lane just a couple of months ago, uh, one of the, the conclusions of the reason behind the October 7th massacre that Hamas brutally inflicted upon southern Israel were claims about the fact that the Islamic Republic of Iran sought to 
dissuade the Saudis from normalizing relations with uh, uh, Israel, and therefore uh, is this now a, a slap in the face of the Ayatollah regime uh, at a time when it uh, seems to somehow lose once again ground throughout much of the Arabian Gulf? Well, um, clearly the uh, Houthi provocations, which are not Houthi uh, provocations, they are Iranian provocations. And interestingly enough, this was stated openly by uh, the U.S. Central Command in its response to the attacks on, on shipping, are part of a much larger pattern. Uh, and in fact, the, the war we are in right now with Hamas, uh, at the end of the day, is part of a larger story uh, of uh, the struggle between the camp of stability in the region. Uh, and that's been going on for the last decade uh, and more. Uh, and the various forces of Islamist totalitarianism and in in the various manifestations, whether this is ISIS, uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood offshoots such as Hamas, which turn out to be just as brutal and murderous as uh, as Daesh, um, the Iranians and the whole uh, uh, slew of proxies, all of them uh, on one side or uh, in, in, in so quite often quarreling to the death with each other, but all of them threatening the stability and prosperity and 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 uh, and the future. Uh, of the region, uh, the things that uh, that uh, Dr. Barnes and Nia spoke about. Now, um, what uh, the United States has been working on, uh, the Saudi Arabia uh, Israeli normalization, uh, was in fact embedded in a larger scheme of things, which also included India. And I remind you of, of the idea of the IMEEC, the India Mid Middle East uh, Economic Corridor. And Israel is not uh, necessarily the terminus here. Israel is a way station uh, to uh, to Europe. Uh, this uh, is in competition uh, with Iran's ambitions to dominate the region. It's also in competition with China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So we f we we now find that the, this this one single act of threatening international shipping. Uh, that uh, the, Iran the Iranians committed via their uh, Houthi uh, proxies has actually um, broadened the scope of this crisis and embedded it more firmly in the international context. And this is something that President Biden, uh, I think, uh, recognized and, and spoke to uh, right from the beginning, that uh, the, the challenge posed by Hamas to Israel's existence is not detached from the challenge posed by others to the existence of, of democracies under challenge. He spoke, he saw the connection with Ukraine. We can think of other uh, arenas in the international uh, uh, game, global game, uh, that uh, that uh, bear some relevance here. So Israel's war against Hamas is an essential part of a much larger issue, and therefore Israel must win because it is not only our survival that is at stake. Thank you, Dr. Lerman. Uh, one point that you, you started with, and uh, you highlighted, of course, the statement by Central Command, uh, which noted that it's an Iranian aggression. And, and when I initially spoke to an American official about this uh, new initiative and the arrangement that cited, uh, that uh, brought about the agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, seeing uh, the the goods transit over land uh, through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all the way to the port of Haifa, and then from there onwards to towards Europe, uh, he highlighted uh, that, of course, the all those goods still have to transit through the Strait of Hormuz, which happens to be a lot closer to the Iranians than uh, one of its proxies. Now, of course, Mr. Oren, uh, this may bring about some new challenges uh, that the Iranians have not so quickly resorted to uh, in light of not too distance of a history, namely uh, Operation Praying Mantis, when uh, the ramifications of attempting to block the Strait of Hormuz have brought about devastating consequences to the Iranian Navy. Close uh, to the time when uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was uh, 
the United States and especially President Reagan's arch enemy. This was uh, not uh, uh, too far away in time from uh, the hostage crisis, uh, the 444 days uh, of the hostage crisis in the American embassy in Tehran. And at that time, the United States tilted towards Iraq in the uh, Iran-Iraq war. And now, of course, uh, the uh, strategic uh, uh, context is, uh, is totally different. However, the fact that Iran itself um, is uh, quite cautious and only sends proxies to uh, threaten shipping says a lot about its fear that its own shipping, its own uh, port facilities, uh, it has a very long coast, they too uh, could be hit. And one interesting point, which is at least true as we speak now, may change uh, as the war goes on. Hamas did not try up to now to hit the gas barracks that Israel has, uh, neither did Hezbollah. Um, whether they uh, want to spare them uh, because of uh, uh, some fear that the international or multinational uh, corporations having a stake in them will use their leverage uh, against them, or whether they have uh, some other consideration in mind. It's still interesting to see that um, up to now, the uh, uh, gas facilities are not hostages. Indeed. Well, uh, particularly about uh, the analogy, of course, we can go back and forth about this. But if I, I'm not mistaken, just three, four months ago, we had six American hostages being released in exchange for $6 billion of Iranian frozen assets, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, or has brought about an uproar uh, from many people around the world, uh, indicating uh, a certain American uh, approach that uh, it contradicts its own national security interests, but that's uh, a different story. And I'd like to ask you, Dr. Bohms, particularly about the latter part that uh, Mr. Oren just mentioned, and that is uh, the the ownership of the Leviathan and the Tamar and the, the other uh, oil or offshore gas rigs uh, adjacent to Israel's shores or within its uh, EEZ uh, are owned by Chevron, uh, an American multinational uh, corporation. And within that context, if those oil rigs are struck, does it it's, uh, basically... Uh, entail a, a breach of U.S. national security interests and give it the green light within that context to go to war? Well, I think we've seen uh, growing American presence uh, in the Middle East, and this is, relates not just to the Mediterranean Sea, but also to the Gulf. And we've seen more assertive action uh, in the past few months, and I believe for a reason. Um, and I also believe that uh, the fact that uh, the uh, architecture, gas architecture, uh, is now uh, shared uh, with the Americans, uh, potentially soon also with the Europeans, um, and also with the Emiratis, uh, gives a, a certain uh, context to uh, the attempt uh, of either Hamas or more or perhaps uh, National Hezbollah to uh, uh, to tackle them. Uh, uh, the scenario itself uh, is, is tricky. Hamas uh, had other uh, potential infrastructure to which he could uh, have aimed its missiles, and we've had some reports that they had tried. Um, but it's not so easy to to aim with what they have uh, uh, and to do this uh, effectively. Uh, it may be a different case uh, when it comes to Hezbollah. Uh, and if we'll, if we'll get to that uh, phase. Uh, but one of the reasons when the Americans are here is this broader danger, and this, what you just discussed is one dimension of it, of having a broader configuration. There are other interests involved, uh, and there are certainly uh, proxy forces that fight on behalf of other countries, uh, namely uh, Iran, that attempts to, to push this uh, in creating a multi-front uh, war. And we need to uh, uh, tackle them and understand the ramifications 
uh, to energy markets, uh, to sustainability, and to the interest of other countries. Uh, that may help explain to see certainly the American response and perhaps some of what we just discussed, uh, even with the Emiratis, uh, that they're saying, look, we need to move forward uh, and not let uh, this uh, Iranian-led interest uh, control uh, to be the sole factor of controlling the agenda of the Middle East. Dr. Lerman, your take on this? I don't know if uh, the, the fact that the Israeli uh, uh, facilities in the eastern Mediterranean have not been uh, targeted yet indicates a lack of will or a lack of, uh, of capability in terms of accuracy, the part of Hamas. For Hezbollah, we have reasons to worry about their uh, advances in terms of accuracy, but uh, they, uh, there we have our own deterrent posture vis-a-vis -vis the future of Lebanon, because if uh, Lebanon will be denied uh, its, uh, its um, potential of uh, uh, gas production, then uh, its economic uh, collapse will only become worse and worse as time goes by. And this is, uh, it, 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 I think at this point, um, um, the American envoy, Amos Hochstein, is now trying to essentially uh, negotiate a package vis-a-vis uh, -vis Lebanon, which would uh, uh, possibly also involve the removal of Hamas uh, from the uh, uh, border area, and uh, on the part of Israel, some guarantees for Lebanon's uh, safety and, and economic interests. Um, I don't know if it will ultimately work. Uh, Hezbollah has its own uh, agenda, which does not necessarily cohere with the needs of the Lebanese as a people. But at least it's, a, it's an interesting effort in, in so far as it is becoming increasingly clear that Israel will not consent to a return to the uh, status quo ante in, uh, in southern Lebanon uh, any more than it will consent to uh, Hamas control in Gaza. And so a, a deal uh, that would uh, resolve this without uh, actually re resort to, follow, to, to violence uh, would be beneficial for both sides. Thank you, Dr. Lerman. Mr. Oren, uh, if we may also focus on the Turkey uh, angle of this war, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been nothing but uh, a vocal rhetoric of anti-Israel slurs uh, with focus also on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. What can you tell us about that? So, uh, notwithstanding the domestic uh, political uh, arena in Turkey and uh, uh, Erdogan's uh, uh, various calculations regarding the elections, um, the last, the preceding two years, up to October the 7th, um, were uh, exemplified by a rapprochement between uh, Erdogan, first the Bennett Lapid uh, government, and then the Netanyahu government. And uh, they seemed uh, on the verge of uh, a second honeymoon. Of course, Israel and Turkey had their first honeymoon in the 1990s, and then they had their divorce under Erdogan, uh, if such a divorce uh, is permissible under Muslim Sharia. And um, all of that uh, has gone down the drain because of uh, Erdogan's affinity for Hamas uh, as an offshoot of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And um, if uh, Erdogan acts impulsively and emotionally rather than... Uh, uh, thinking about the Turkish national interest, uh, he will be shunted aside. Of course, he's a member in uh, relatively good standing of NATO. Um, uh, they need him for the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, because Israel is now uh, in the CENTCOM area of uh, responsibility, uh, Turkey doesn't have the same nuisance value it had vis-a-vis Israel when uh, UCOM, the European Command, and therefore NATO, had uh, jurisdiction over Israel. So Turkey seems to be losing a lot of clout. It may still save some if it takes part in a deal, which right now does not seem in the cards, but who knows, um, to take the Hamas leadership out of Gaza and deport them, if not to Qatar, then to Turkey. 
Indeed. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to give uh, both our distinguished guests uh, the final sentence each, uh, just one sentence. Dr. Bums, we'll start with you. It's good that the region is still moving and not captured by the uh, Iran-Hamas agenda that gives at least some hope for the future. Dr. Leoman? I think it, in, in all of this, we must pay very close attention to the centrality of Egypt once again emerging as a, in the, the indispensable partner of the indispensable nation, uh, the United States, in, uh, in setting the, the scene for a post-war situation that could stabilize the region. Indeed, uh, Egypt is a very important actor, uh, irrespective of its latest uh, dealings with both uh, Russia and particularly China, uh, sending uh, once again a, a satellite into orbit uh, via a Chinese launching pad. Uh, Mr. Owen, final sentence. We are on the verge of a presidential and congressional election year in the United States. And obviously, whoever sits in the White House come January 20th, 2025 will have a major impact on regional uh, events here. Well, global events indeed. This is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Lerman, Dr. Bums, and Mr. Oren, of course, for taking out of your time to update us uh, on the latest. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update, from here in Jerusalem, Shalom. Deputy National Security Advisor to the Government of Israel, currently Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, a think tank, and the editor of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. For the last few years, I've been a regular panelist for TV7, a fantastic opportunity to bring deep and analytical perspectives to the debate over regional affairs, Israeli affairs, international affairs, in the company of some of the best minds in Israel. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at tv7israelnews.com.